Good afternoon. It being four o'clock on April 1st, 2019, I call to order the Committee on City Services and the Northampton City Council. And would you call the roll, please? Sure. sure. Councillor Carney. Present. Councillor Labarge. Present. Councillor Bidwell. Here. And Councillor Nash. Here. Thank you. And I'll note that this is this proceeding is being audio and video recorded. Seeing no public comment. We have today with mm -hmm. us an update on the building department activity, permit volume, and I'll ask please to join us, if you would, at the table, Lou, if that's okay. Sure. It's easier for the camera. Yes. And um, Lou Hasbrook, who is uh, the building commissioner of the city of Northampton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. I'll turn over to you if you'd like to. Okay, so I thought um, this was mostly about short-term rentals, right? And I, I did a, um, a sheet up um, about what I know about short-term rentals, and uh, it's and it's confusing. And probably the most confusing aspect of it is that, is that there's any number of, of terms and definitions of of what I think is generally getting referred to as short-term mm -hmm. rentals. Some, um, some are more, more specific than others. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, the, the numbers of allowable rental rooms varies, it seems, between three and five and six and beyond. Six or more it switches to another uh, level if you're talking about certain codes. Um, and I think until we sit down until the city sits down and figures that and, and decides and I think what what they're gonna regulate under this new statute um, then we can figure then then the city can decide what regulations they want to bring to bear on it. Yes please thank you. Um, Louie I know like off on Ryan Road about a year and a half ago, we had an accessory apartment made for one of my residents for his mom and dad. Mm -hmm. The father has died, so say as an example, the mother passes away, mm -hmm. can they go ahead and use that as a rental? Well, the, with something like that, um, if, it was, if it was done as an accessory apartment, the owner of the property has to live in one or the other of the units. Okay, so say I'm the owner mm -hmm. and whatever, my parents have passed away. Mm -hmm. As long as I live there, I could rent that? Yes, and, and the, the, the regulations that, my piece of the regulations, don't speak at all to a dwelling unit like that. If, if it's a single dwelling unit, whether it's a standalone single family house or an apartment, um, that's not the, the building code regulations don't address that at all. I don't think the fire code regulations do the the, the short term rental the, the regulations that seem to relate to what we call short term rentals are bed and breakfast renting a house a room in the house. One of the big uh, factors is uh, whether the occupancy is permanent or transient, and that actually it's transient or non-transient. You can rent a room in your house to your to somebody um, is for a period longer than 30 days, and it's just, and it's no different from your child, your son, or your daughter living in a room. Um, I think that what they're, what the, most of the regulations focus on is, is short-term rental. Um, other towns put a lot of, you know, have other towns speak directly to single family homes, vacation homes. When you get down mm -hmm. near the shore, some towns have real specific regulations about um, somebody who rents their house out for a week at a time when they don't, when they don't live there. The building code doesn't address that at all. I don't think fire code does either. I, I'm talking with a resident in Ward 7. 
she told me that she was for what we were going to be doing, hopefully with short-term rentals. And on her street, and she's a retired police officer, there is a house. And she said, sometimes people are there for a small period of time, and the house is never kept up, the lawns are never kept up, and she was really hoping that there would be significant changes with the short-term rentals. So how do we handle something like that if the people are not here that own it, they live in another state, but they're doing short-term, but then they're renting longer, and then they go back to short-term, and are not taking care of their properties? Well, I think the short-term rental, the, the, the aspect of short-term rentals that is going to get addressed by the un because of the latest statute is going to be a general ordinance and, and not a zoning ordinance. I don't think zoning is going to get involved in the financial part of it. Um, how it does, how zoning does address it, I don't know. I, that I think remains to be seen. Right now, zoning requires that a bed and breakfast, and, and they define, Northampton defines bed and breakfast as um, a maximum of three rooms, and they require a special permit from three or fewer rooms. Three or fewer rooms. Breakfast included, reserved and advanced. Right. Okay. But, but then you can have four or more rooms are let, and that would be the bed and breakfast establishment? Uh, that's, see, see, there's that's true. everybody has their own little bite of, that, of this apple. Mm -hmm. um, licensing, the licensing statute, the, the, the excise tax statute, um, the fire department, the fire statute, the, the fire code, code mm -hmm. and, and the building code, and then the zoning ordinance, and each has a different number of, you know, right. and, oh, and the health yeah, code, yeah. too. Right. Each has a different, each has chosen a different number of, of rooms and, and a different name to call it, too. Yeah. Rooming house, lodging house, right. mm -hmm. uh, yeah. bed and breakfast. So, I just had a question. Please, Let please, me. yeah. Um, so is there, I, I got the, the impression that at some point, there's going to be some effort between your department, fire, and health, public health, to to try and you know come at it from a lot of different ways and see if there was one city approach that would emerge as to regulation of short-term rentals. Is that? Yeah. It's. I think it's going to start with the financial piece of it, and I think that that's what triggered the discussion about it, and the new statute. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty certain that the new statute says that um, places like Airbnb and other uh, organizations that, that coordinate these rentals is gonna, are going to have to tell the municipalities who's, who's, in, who's registered with right. them. And, <clears throat> and what the city does with that um, remains to be seen. Um, as far as the building code's concerned, um, a building official can't go into an existing single-family home. Right. Um, just can't. Um, you mean without complaint? Without uh, some other registered some, some reason to believe that there's a life safety issue. Um, so just a routine inspection could not be conducted. Not by not by the building official. Right. The fire department has the fire fire department has more latitude. Mm -hmm. What the city could require as part of this registration process is is not clear to me yet. Right. Um, and um, some towns have I I put a fair amount of time and energy into looking at what other towns are doing about it, and some towns use their fire department. Um, to inspect, and but they're primarily focused on smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. Um, if someone were to come to the building department and say, I want to turn my house into a bed and breakfast, we would say, as far as the building code's concerned, you need to put a sprinkler system. Mm -hmm. 
need to put what? A sprinkler system in the house. And that's that came from for the anybody? most recent code. What for for anybody that wants to yeah. turn yeah. their house into, into a bed and breakfast and or an Airbnb even? Well, there's no different. Airbnb is right. just so any bed and breakfast needs to be sprinkled. Any new bed oh, and that isn't grandfathered at this right. point, right? Right. But ah. so if my if my neighbor, when their uh, daughter heads off to college, she mm -hmm. decides that they want to rent out that room through Airbnb. Mm -hmm. Sprinkler their house. In theory, so if that would be a new unit, they would be required to sprinkler well, the house or sprinkler that room or no the house. Yeah. I, I mean it, it and it's pretty it's pretty clear, but what's um, it because it's a change of use, because mm -hmm. in the building code they define um, uh, let me just find it. Um, Owner occupied lodging houses with five or fewer guest rooms. A lodging house is one family dwelling. One or more occupants are primarily permanent in nature, which is and which rent is paid for guest rooms. And they define guest rooms, um, and it becomes a change of use from right. a regular single-family home, and that tr change of use would trigger the requirements to put a sprinkler system. Um, Any change of use or just this? This change of use it, with a single family home would trigger that yep. requirement. Other um, other changes of uses? Just to change, for example, for a single, single family to a two family well, would require a sprinkler. It would have to go to a, a, a three family. Okay, at three family. Is, it, is in a different code, so it moves okay. it out of the residential. Code. I see, and then you need a sprinkler. Um, or there's sometimes there's a way around it too that yeah. um, they call and and so if you do X Y a three family home would need a sprinkler system, but you might be able to avoid putting a sprinkler system in a three family home that you created out of a two family home if other safety life safety feature features were uh, more than they needed to be. And just to follow up on that, right, a typical, and I'm talking ballpark, we're talking $100,000 for a three-family home for a sprinkler system. No, I think less than that. Seventy. Um, I mean, but it's, it's, it's expensive. It's I mean, a, it's, 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 it's a big I don't know. I, don't know. I just know a couple but, of different places that needed sprinklers. Uh, you know, Twenty thousand. Uh, you can you could put a sprinkler system in a, in a single family home when you're building it for about eight thousand dollars. Right. The prices have gone down. But I think that most people are going to just say that, oh, I've been renting rooms for a long time, and that's going to be the way that people address it. I I already mm. I already know that. Say this is no change of use. So I've heard that from other communities. Yeah. yeah. That's so confusing. Well, it is confusing. It is. I mean, the idea that there's not, a, there's not a single uh, definition that covers that that each aspect of the statute regulations or statutes that regul that that applied should use this. They should have some consistency, right. um, but they don't. So we're stuck with that. So who monitors all this? as far as her and I could own a house, we live in it, and we have like four bedrooms, but we have a dear friend that's coming in to live with us. Mm -hmm. Does that change right there? That per I mean, you're not taking rent from an individual. They come in to stay with you, to live with you. Well, I think rent is, is, rent is a big, is a very specific trend. Right. I think if you don't rent to somebody, um, no. Right. Okay. Right. Please. Yeah, so the thing, I, the sticking point is you're, Louie, you're referring to like bed and breakfast, like um, Craig Della Pena's place out on the, the rail trail. They they need to meet, meet these types of regulations. But are you saying that if somebody does an Airbnb and rents out one bedroom for, um, that they, they need to put in a sprinkler system? Well, that's what the building code says. Right. Okay. I mean, all right. it, does, it does say that. Right. So right now, all of these Airbnbs that are currently operating are out of compliance. 
Well, well no, they're grandfathers. They're not, they're grandfathers. If they'll be grandfathers. There's a grandfathering <laughs> aspect of it. Right. Right. Um, if you if you Do create if you built a house and said this is going to be a B and B, you'd have to put a sprinkler system in it. If you came and said I want to make my house into a B and B, you, you'd have to put a sprinkler system in it. What, and that um, regulation is now in effect. Right. Okay. So at, at, yeah. So at, so as of what, what what's the date that that regulation went into effect? Uh, January. 1st, 2018. 18. 2018. Right. Which is when the which is when the current building code became effective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Wow. That's a very important piece of information right now. But it also isn't altogether clear to me how well it's being enforced. By whom? By people that. But by which responsible party in the city? Say again? By which responsible party in the city? Well, no, I think it more of a statewide. Oh, statewide? Right. But how? But still, there has to be a city oversight. Well, who would be responsible in the city to the monitor that? Uh, it would be you. Right. Okay. Um, one of the things that's going to happen, one of the things that's coming out of this most recent step, uh, legislation is that pe there's going to be. Um, the cities are going to cities and towns are going to find out how many B and Bs there are in their community. Right. That's the biggest the biggest thing that's that's going to be the thing that starts and then how people cope with it uh, going forward is uh, is something that re remains to be seen. I mean, I think that how uh, if somebody if this if the town or the city finds out that. 123 Main Street uh, in in some town in Massachusetts is a B and B. They're going to they're going to then have a discussion about. But if it's been a B and B for a while, for if it's an existing B and B, just because they're now registering it doesn't mean they have to put a sprinkler system. In. What is it going to mean? That's the piece that um, that I think is going to there's going to be a lot of discussion about it. And because this is going to be, the reports are going to be about places that are already registered, this, I think there might be the presumption that they've already been B&Bs. Otherwise, they wouldn't be registered with Airbnb or whichever other service they, they're registered with. So one of the things that Mr. Della Pena was telling us about the difference between his service and the Airbnb service is that he's at he's providing a a lodging experience where they're preparing meals that they have to have special mm -hmm. dining and cleaning and all of this kind of stuff and that the health inspector comes in and there's all of that whereas your typical Airbnb isn't providing other they might say there's coffee on the here's a coffee pot you know who knows maybe they make pancakes and all sorts of stuff as an addition but that um we don't i think we we haven't made that distinction here although mr della Pena says that distinction has been made and all of these other people are doing similar stuff but they're flying he called it i think flying under the radar or something distinction yes, made by whom? Mm -hmm. you said the distinction's been made by whom what is well it? we've already kind of made the distinction as to here's what a b a, a b and b is well b &B. i think we need to use the term bed and breakfast so here's what and then bed and b &B. breakfast. B &B. Yes. because i mean most people think of the same thing but bed and breakfast for us is everything that mr del pennant provides B and B is more like an Airbnb, which is you rent a room online. Is that show consistent up. though with our definition? To I, no, I'm trying to think of it just so we can talk about it. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it, because I, I think there's many Airbnbs, like you yes. said, that provide the similar services that Craig Del Penner. Right, but they're not meeting the regulations. That was part of what Craig's point which is. Which part of the regulation? That was the so which part? That to serve food, to serve breakfast in that lodging. Serve sort safe of, certifications and those. All sort of things. and right. separate okay. silverware and all of that kind okay, of stuff. I see. Mm -hmm. So part of this point is I'm regulated. I see. And and I'm meeting all of the requirements. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, I'm competing against all of these other businesses that aren't meeting these regulations. Um, well, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure that that's not 
um, a distinction without a difference because depending on I'm not sure where he believes that um, serving breakfast is any sort of requirement to, to be classified as a bed and breakfast right. um, because because there's there's one set of, of criteria um, and I'm going to check to me to see which one it is um, Um, General Law 64, Mass General Law Chapter 64 G um, has, has the rep refers to breakfast, but that's only the room excise tax statute. Mm -hmm. It's not the licensing statute, which is GL 140, which has, which is the one that differentiates between um, um, Yeah, you're referring to the to the distinction here between bed and breakfast establishment and bed and breakfast home, mm -hmm. right? Which are defined in Mass Chapter 64G. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like the Craig de la Pella establishment is a bed and breakfast establishment because four or more rooms are left, breakfast included, reserved in advance, mm -hmm. and the difference is three or fewer breakfast included reserved in events that's a bread and breakfast home but both of those are different than many of the already allowed Airbnb establishments that may or may or may not include breakfast Northampton zoning ordinance doesn't have doesn't doesn't require breakfast speak to breakfast at all right. um, and, it, and, it, and it's I don't remember that it's a yeah, I think you just do a text search and not come up with breakfast in the zone. And then, and then, um, Northampton zoning limits a bed and breakfast to three three rooms, six individuals, right. three rooms with two people apiece. Right. So, what? How does four? How does a, a, a bed and breakfast? How does a place with four rooms? To rent fit into the process or a two family where the single owner lets out six of the rooms the three rooms upstairs and the three rooms downstairs I know people who do that mm -hmm. in Boston mm -hmm. with a two family mm -hmm. home live there mm -hmm. still or what about some, uh, what about a place where the owner doesn't live and it's and it's rented right right, right. right. Um, it'd be well, simpler to it'd be nice to just none of this existing just well, I start over and create. No, I think that I think that it's, it's, you know because because there's all these overlapping yeah. um, as, aspects of the regulation of whatever happens in in the in the in these in these houses, um, you know, the city could you know be relatively arbitrary right. and and choose uh, definitions. Um, you know, n call, name them, define them, and then regulate them. Can we do that? And oh, I'm sorry. Can we do that in overlooking what state regulations already have? Well, defined? I think the state regulations will then land on top of it, um, and the d degree to which the state regulations land on top of it is is. Um, Does the state regulation or the local regulation apply? Uh, the most restrictive. <laughs> the most restrictive. Okay, that's what that. Okay, applies. so it could then be the the local the local uh, restrictive mm -hmm. council. Thank you. Um, I know with Greg and also with D and John Clapp with the bed and breakfast, a big concern was the language of professional. That bothered them. Professional. D also. And I've had many talks with her on her bed and breakfast. And she did explain also of the Board of Health coming in on a yearly basis and how she has to separate all her utensils, okay, that they use versus the people that come in to stay at that bed and breakfast. So there was concerns about the language of professional. Somebody's going to have to define it, um, you know, because because is that a local or state? the um, I don't know. well, I think the professional piece is. I mean, 
coming out of the, the most recent uh, yes. statute. Yeah. yeah, and it has and, a state on it, so it's professional. Right. And you could, uh, you know, what is, I don't understand, I don't know, I'm not in a position to make these kind of, dis like I say, it's, it's um, just, you know, distinctions without, essentially without a difference, I think. Or are you are you suggesting that ultimately we need a, a city ordinance that clarifies definitions, and that would then determine under which regulations different right. that, pieces that, of That's how I would, yeah. you know, I think the the place to start is for the city to take all that's out there currently, look at it, put it together, um, choose some some choose something that they can put a box around. Um, and, and then go from there. I mean, the, the health regulations um, come from, um, you know, a set of overlapping regulations, the minimum standards for human habitation, which is one section um, of the health code, and then, and then serving, you know, the serving provisions, the uh, food service aspects of the health code. And I don't know where the health department is at this point with that. Hmm. Would you recommend something like, I mean, not officially recommend, but would it make sense to have you and the health director or the planning department, you know, just come together in terms of seeing what would make sense in terms of common definitions? Well, there are, we already had that meeting, yep. and we came away from it with, um, the idea that we needed to go back to the office and figure out what it is we wanted to bring to the table, um, but it's got to be this. There has to be some some reason to 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 work on it, and and we're going to have to look at some kind of dis, you know definitions. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any way that we can help in that effort at all? I mean, we're certainly interested, and in if that helps in terms of passing that along, I'm assuming. I, I think it should come from the top down. Okay. And then once, 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 and and then it becomes a you know it goes it goes up and down the hill. But but the idea that what are we gonna what are we trying to accomplish? What do we want to do with this? And and then what what are we, what are we going to do to to make this happen? Mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> it's. Well, plus at some point we'll have benefit of this registry coming from the state, right. and we'll know what sort of scope what, what, what's out there. And if there's you know if there's 63 places that are registered, we go through and kind of take a look at what they are and what's what what are the ones that we care about, and which ones not. Yeah. And it's big implications too for those folks who thought you know they might rent out a room or two. You know, knowing what that requires now in terms of investment with a sprinkler system mm -hmm. and all the rest of that. Well, I mean, that's an important. Yeah. That really, that I think, you know, could just be an eight thousand job. But I just know a couple that have cost it six <clears> figures. <throat> mm -hmm. So. So my thoughts are that in terms of us setting up a way to inventory um, these businesses, would if it best mirrors what we have on record with the city in terms of the the properties is because they're listed as you know the property a is listed as a single family home property b is a two family home is that right mm -hmm. and then and then on on top of that we're applying this airbnb unit mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. because the way airbnb is looking at this these are all units mm -hmm. you know and it's it, they don't care whether it's you know the the second uh, unit in a in an apartment building or whether it's just somebody's bed extra bedroom mm -hmm. and and my guess is that it would be best if we went about it worked it backwards from our records rather than trying to figure out what Airbnb is going to provide us because we're going to I think in the end we'll get all of these potential you know well here's all the money that was earned by Airbnb in Northampton and then we have to sort through okay how many people are exempt because then we have to figure out you know who has a you know which of these airbnb rentals is actually in you know the the original 
unit which the family lives in or is in the accessory structure or is actually you know the third apartment that could be rented right now so um but we don't have um we, i mean the city knows who's the city could we could dig out without not you know with with some effort who's already who has a special permit for a bed and breakfast or alternately who got a special permit for bed and breakfast over over time right um if some you know people don't have to if somebody moved and now it's not a B and B, we we wouldn't know that. I think we need to see what comes from the, you know through the state, and then apply that, and we can push that back into the information we already we do have, which is is it a single family, two family, a three family? Um, so we should fly by the seat of our pants at that. Well, I think we're going to take what we get in right. terms of information, you know, the 312 listings that uh, come from Airbnb plus there's, I think, a couple other services um, and plow that back through and see what we come up with. Right, you could just easily cross-check those 312 right. that are in your hand. Well, I don't know, easily, but... Well, um, <laughs> it might take 312 hours, but... Well, it take, you know, what we'd have to do is, you know, create some kind of... Uh, uh, relational data, yeah. probably a spreadsheet that we get to, um, to cross it over, and then I, and then see what we got. I still have concerns because I did hear one resident speak in regards to renting off some rooms, okay, bedrooms, but making an office out of it. <laughs> Don't you have to have a permit? In order to run a business and, and run an office? No, there's this, the rights, the, the home businesses and home occupations split into two places, but a home, um, a home business is, is allowed by right. Um, you know, until I, I, I honestly can't remember what the things that trigger the requirement for a, mm -hmm. a special permit but it's pretty clearly spelled out and it got a lot mm -hmm. more, um, it got more liberal um, about in 2015. But no, you can, have a, um, you, could, you can have a therapist's office in your house as long as you stay within the constraints okay. of, the, of the ordinance without, um, okay. without a permit. My big concern is who is going to monitor who is bed and breakfast? That's going to be an easy one for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, looking up and so forth like that. But having these rooms and renting them off, somebody can just—they don't have to apply. They'll just do it. And this is what was said about from D. Clap and them that people are doing it and they're not registered. Well. People do an awful lot of things without <laughs> You're so right. much of the fairly well. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think the history of people right. renting rooms out of their house is right. long and long and long. I mean, I know yes. the house I moved into 25 years ago was an older woman who rented out the mm -hmm. rooms, the right. four other rooms in the house, to mm -hmm. four yeah. old gentlemen, and you know, I mean, it's and they come from a long history of <laughs> rooming houses. I mean, I think it's mm -hmm. there are certainly those that are licensed lodging houses and then there are those that are maybe under the radar but people have been renting rooms in their houses for but the, decades. Um, and that's my concern sessions. how does this monitor who, who watches this but as soon as it's as soon as someone stays for the 31st day it's no longer transient housing it's no longer short term right hmm. then it's medium or it's no, not long term right have, well, even as a roommate they just they had to pick a day. They had to pick a, a number, and 30 days is the number. And so, so transient housing and the difference, say, between a hotel, motel, and an apartment building is sort of established at transient and non-transient occupancy. And transient occupancy is 30 days or less. Right. Non-transient occupancy mm -hmm. is some 
length of time longer. Does that include the person who is on the lease for an apartment but takes on a roommate? Is that roommate then fall into that category? I mean, so, because we know that that happens all the time. So you're renting out, you're on the lease and you have an extra room and so you take a roommate. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that also in the category of the, does that have to be regulated? If it's, you know, in theory it would, it would fall under the lodging house, rooming house, bed and, and breakfast. Unless they're on the lease. If it was less than 30 days, and if it's more than 30 days, then it's just another roommate. And, oh, okay. And, and, and oh, I see. And so, okay. Um, now I understand. It's not transient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, so, so then that, that, that's a roommate, and that doesn't put you in any category of renting out a room, per se, or other reasons. So during our discussions with the mayor um, around this topic, um, that he, th there was something about 90 days, that 90 days is enough, that's when it becomes long term? Well, the, the see, see, uh, it's, some are defined, some aren't defined, the most explicit definition I can find comes out of the building code and it has to do with transient and non-transient mm -hmm. and it it creates it does a lot of um, it defines a lot of aspects of the building code um, and I think that other um, Northampton zoning uses the word transient, um, and um, the um, you know the state the building code uses in the commercial side of it transient and non-transient in the residential side it says primarily permanent, um, and then it also says guests. Um, you know, so, I mean, so I think the city's got to sit down right. and, yes. and decide what words they're going to use and what criteria they're going to yeah. use and then go from there. And I think that once the city gets from the state the reports that come out of the Airbnb and other, and other you know, booking sites, see what the situation, and we'll figure out what the situation is. And if we have suggestions, should we send them to you? Should should send them to the mayor? <laughs> I think that we I think start with the mayor's office yeah, okay. because they're they're that's where it was think kind of for the start. <laughs> well, presumably down the road when there is some clarity about all this. Um, to, to address the concern about expanding the requirement for inspections, uh, which I know is a big concern, there's always so many personalities around. Mm -hmm. It could always be the option of asking folks to sign some affidavit the way we do in other situations. I don't know if this key or not. Yeah. This uh, is council multitasking. <laughs> Somebody needs the elevator. And Probably doesn't do that, so that's a newer one. Let me see if I can pop over there. I have the key to the front door of this, but I don't think that it's open. Is she referring to the back door? I don't know. <laughs> What's going on here? Oh, I see a sneeze. Where is she going? To get to the oh, I see, because they lock. I, right. I know what door she's preferring. I do not have a key to that door. Right. Well, anyway. Well, I'd like to take this opportunity to just say some nice things. Uh, <laughs> Louie, I want to thank you for, you know, you've been 
really helpful in a lot of stuff that's come up in, in uh, my ward. Lots of questions about stuff on property and uh, property lines, and you've been really helpful, and you've been really great with uh, when it pointed constituents your way, so thank you. Well, I like, North, I like working in Northampton, and this is part, you know, part of it is that I think it works, we work pretty well. Um, there's a supportive aspect of it that you, I, don't, I haven't seen in other towns. Hmm. So. And Tony, um, I also have worked with Tony Patillo for many, many years, and you also in the office. And I want to thank you for everything that you have done in the city, and especially Ward 6. It's becoming busy again. And <laughs> I thank you for helping me, guiding me, because it has not been easy. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, the report that I didn't bring a uh, handout report on building permits, but um, and we do we keep track on a fiscal year basis. So we're you know we're two thirds I mean three quarters of the way through FY19, we're on track for um, you know uh, building permits took a big jump in in FY15 and they've stayed consistently higher than they've been in the past both. Uh, raw numbers and then value of permits. Mm -hmm. We do see the value go up um, because there's because of inflation, but um, but just the numbers of permits that we're doing um, and there have been uh, as, aside from Smith College, which um, the permits numbers go up and down depending on I guess what their endowment is doing. Um, the consistently across the we'll probably have uh, another aside from the apartments we'll probably have another um, 40 new single-family houses which is something that hasn't that just new single families took a, a drop in 2009 10 11 12 13 and they've come back up um, village hill was nearly built out um, and now they now there's 30 more um, in in one subset of the development that that had 85 in it. Um, I think the thing the, one of the things that I was most uh, excited about is the new is the commercial the new commercial building mm -hmm. at Village. It's really nice to get uh, more commercial up there. There's a mixed use. Um, we got her into the elevator. So sorry. <laughs> There's another mixed-use building um, in the works. Um, there's two significant um, solar arrays, one on Park Hill Road and one in, in uh, Willard's Gravel Pit. Um, we have three in Ward 6. Right. One of the, oh, one of the people, uh, the, the people doing one of those called me up and said we're doing a a small array and I'm thinking you know but you know 50 panels and and he said five megawatts which is I think 15,000 panels mm -hmm. oh, oh yes it, uh, and uh, but he's from Kansas and <laughs> they have <laughs> square miles of arrays mm -hmm. out there so um, I think both of the new arrays are going to have some battery storage um, associated with them which is um, and I would be interested to see battery storage is now pour the pads and these things, these battery packs come, uh, you know, and drop them, you know, plug and play. They just plunk them down, bolt them down, and, and then connect them. And uh, one of them, the one that I have heard more about is going to have um, um, about a third of the capacity of the array in storage, which is, you know, something mm -hmm. which is not insignificant. Mm -hmm. um, lots and lots and lots of on, I don't have the number, but, um, you know, residential um, roof mount solar is um, four or five permits a week, probably. So it's, even though the 
some of the rebates have fallen off, it's still very popular. Could we talk about the solar on the roofs and so forth like mm -hmm. that? If you don't want them on your roof, but you'd like them on the ground? Yeah, you could still, there's not much difference between which, there's uh, an upper limit of what you can put on the ground without coming in for special permits, but um, usually that what you can put on the ground is usually more than you can fit on the roof unless you've got a, mm -hmm. you know, a really large house. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we don't see um, the root, the, the ground mount is predicated, uh, the upper limit is predicated on um, what your on-site consumption is. Um, if, if you had a heated driveway and heated swimming pool and, and a giant house, you could probably, you could have a larger ground mount solar array than if you um, had a small house, um, but still can get, uh, even, even at the, even at the lower end, you can get a, um, a ground mount solar array that'll, that is larger than it will fit on most roofs and will, you know, support, a, you know, provide 100% of the electricity of the house. Because I'm looking at going ground. Yeah. It's it's not much different than a um, than a than a shed, mm -hmm. um, and there's a there's actually a, a, a little bit of a um, uh, loophole in the sense that if you built a shed and then put um, like a big wood shed and then put solar on the roof, it could be more. It could be bigger than if. They, that a ground mount or array could be, um, huh. but only one time did I ever run into that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that look for. I don't. Know. So what if you already have a shed? What if you already have a shed <laughs> that's <laughs> built? Put, I mean, put is, you can put solar on that for sure, as long as it's sturdy enough. It's just saying that it's the same yeah. dimensions as yeah, the right. shed, so you can right. put one next to it. Are there any other questions folks have? No, just, just good, good, good luck in sorting this through. Uh, <laughs> the, this is done a great job of reminding us just how complicated it is and how many contradictory definitions there are. And there's a lot of sorting. Yeah, I think it's yeah. going to be, I think that there's going to be some, you know, um, I don't know, arbitrary, but going to have to choose some of the some criteria, real specific criteria. And I mean, one of the things that one of the things that's really important to me is to have a regulation be very specific, yeah. unambiguous, clearly defined, mm -hmm. um, because that's what makes something enforceable. Mm -hmm. um, and here's an example, like what? For example, you shall only have three rooms in the house oh. with so many, you know, is that the kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, pick how many rooms and does breakfast, this actually, is breakfast you know, is, is, uh, what, what constitutes serving a meal and what constitutes right. breakfast. And I mean, to you know that, um, <laughs> that those little wrapped packages of six small donuts don't count as a meal. <laughs> Um, <laughs> they have to come from. They, they have, have to come on. from. Uh, <laughs> oh, they have, have to come from what's it's over here. But put the donut no, I think, glazed. I think those only are the glazed kinds of questions donuts so, qualify. Right. right, right um, th those are the kind of things that are going on, because if, I mean, it's it really is um, interesting how as soon as there's some kind of regulation, there'll be somebody out there that wants to push it. Um, and that um, you know, recently the um, recently a zoning ordinance changed uh, to, and I think you voted on it in February that that a ba uh, bathing facilities in an accessory yes. building right. Right. are are not allowed because you start out with a toilet, and then pretty soon it's a toilet with a right. a wash up a sink, and then it's got a shower and. You know, and then. Um, but we let an eye wash. We are, we're allowing you to wash your eyes. How do you know this? How do you, who monitors? Well, we do. 
I mean, that's, you know, you have to get a permit. But what if they don't? Well, then, then it's then complaint based. Is, is and if a neighbor goes right. like this and looks right. and sees you going naked, it's just like that, yeah. working on with cars, <laughs> right? Everything's <laughs> complaint based. It's not going by right. It's really about whether a neighbor or somebody else files a complaint. Right? Right. Right. It would be like working on vehicles mm -hmm. on your property, putting them on your lawn and selling them, correct? But somebody has a complaint start. Somebody has to complain. It's not Lou's job to go. No, no. I mean, if, if, if you drive by and see a pile of, I mean. of, of, like of you know, things in the yard, somebody work, obviously doing work, <coughs> will stop and look at it. That's that's a piece that's pretty pretty simple. I mean, there's there's a, there's there are roofers that won't take a roofing permit unless they think that they're on a street that people will drive by. And oh, see. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that that's. Because because if you do a lot of, of work, you know the cost of the forty dollars per job for a roofing permit adds up, mm -hmm. um, and and sometimes we see them and you know stop, don't see the permit card in the window, call the office and ask if there is one, or sometimes the neighbors will complain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, well, but but renovating your you know the upstairs of your garage into a into a, a living space is usually pretty obvious and you can do that oh, with permits well not without a permit you can't do any permit just said that and right. and that what they've done is no you can't make your garage into an apartment without without it meeting the criteria right. for an apartment and um or an office, right? Where well, you can office is different from an apartment. You, you can do office work by, with a building permit, but it's allowed by right. But another, a whole other apartment isn't. I gotcha. And so, what makes an apartment? Well, kitchen facilities and bathing Bathrooms facilities. And, and so, when they when they change the ordinance to to prohibit bathing facilities as opposed to a toilet, it made it made things easier for me. Yep. Yeah. Yes. If somebody isn't using that eye wash to yeah. cover their whole body. <laughs> okay. Ready? Yep. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very helpful. Good luck with all this. Yeah, I, was, I think hopefully what I communicated is that it's very complicated. Yes. <laughs> Make sure to Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. <laughs> so want to know, I have to make a quick talk if my, my garage closes at 5 o'clock and I just make, might need to check and make sure my car is ready. Mm -hmm. But um, in the meantime, we have the uh, minutes. So if you want to just take the minutes, I'll just check on those and then we can pull up one of those. I'll be there. Just make yeah, sure I can pick up my car. Okay, I'd like a motion for approval of the minutes. Move approval for March, for March 4th. 4th. Second. All in favor. Aye. Okay. Um, we will move down to um, item five, um, which was referred to our committee for various committees. Disability Commission. Um, I have met Jeremy, great guy, and I know Jim, you know him very well. And him and I had a lengthy talk on the phone, and he did come to one of our city commission, uh, commission on Disability meetings. Very, very, very thorough, very helpful. So when we talked, he gave us, gave me exactly how he feels. He said that he is hoping that we consider him for the position on the Disability Commission. For 41 years ago, he was born with a permanent disability, which is called osteogenesis imperfecta, that left him wheelchair bound with fragile bones. Throughout his life, he's been in a wheelchair. He's observed how society is built around the needs of the able body and often looks the needs of the disabled. As he's grown up, he has increasingly realized that the only way to make positive changes is to stop being a mere observer and actually going out there and getting involved. He says, I've been waiting to play a more active role in improving the lives of disabled people in our community, and I believe am a unique 
position to do so, and I agree with that. In addition to graduating from college with a degree in communications, he's also been deeply involved in music for the past 20 years. He finally decided to speak out about smell removal issues in Northampton, for example, through word of mouth and social media. He was able to reach a wide audience and get an article written about it in the Gazette. He believes that if he is appointed to the commission, he will be able to continue to use his voice and his, and, and his local connections to speak to the community about the issues we are dealing with to gain awareness and support from as many people as possible for all the great work that the Disability Commission already does. He already believes that to have more support from the community and more people aware and encouraging of the Commission's work would lift some burden off the shoulders of the Commission and help us get even more accomplished. I have lived in Northampton for 15 years. I have been riding my electric wheelchair all over town and experienced firsthand the accessibility issues at local businesses, the problem with snow removal in winter, and my, I would like to do everything I can to make a long lasting improvements so that one day people will see Northampton as a community that is more aware of its disabled citizens' needs and is determined to help them meet those needs. So I, I would like to make a motion for a positive recommendation to City Council. Thank I would like to second that. Okay, moved and seconded to send the name Jeremy Dubs to fill a vacancy on the Disability Commission to the full City Council with a positive recommendation. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I hear no opposed or abstentions. That passes. Thank you. And Councillor Bigelow? Yes, I uh, spoke last week with Ben Capistrant, I think is how he pronounces it. He has been in Northampton for several years. He's on the Smith faculty. His uh, fields of uh, research and investigation and writing um, are very much uh, in the areas of gerontology and demographics um, as they affect different um, aging issues. And I think what he is very much interested in doing is at some level seeing what the intersection is between his academic work and the real work of the Council on Aging. And uh, I think that input is very much uh, desired by, by the director and by the council. So I think it sounds like a good fit. So he looks forward to joining the Council on Aging. So I would uh, put forward a motion and a positive recommendation for Ben Capistrant for Council on Aging. Okay. okay, moved and seconded to send the name Ben Capistrand for the positive recommendation to the Council on Aging to the full City Council for the positive recommendation. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I think that's unanimous. And may I just say that both of these, I think, are excellent um, appointments. Um, and lately I've been pretty excited about the caliber of appointments mm -hmm. we get to all these committees. And just remind folks, we did, I'm not sure if it went to everyone, um, Laura, but that little co conversation between court and... Right, about yeah. the annual yeah, and I, appointments. I thought I sent it to all of uh, uh, Did you folks know? Oh, so it's yeah, basically yes, saying that. that there may be 53 appointments that come could come to us. There weren't that many last year. Right, but there may be, well, it was good thinking yeah. that we had to think in advance right, because... With the possibility of 53 that might come to us before the end of June. That's how many are expiring, June 30th, June 30th, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe how many? 53. 53. <laughs> counted. <laughs> well, that's like I said. So if we look at that, that's like 12 apiece, 13 apiece. Yeah. 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 Which isn't too bad. If, you yeah, think if we spread it out over a few know, months, right, right. we're, we're doing three, The sooner months. they can get us those names, I mean, that's one thing we could do. If we could get all those names in advance, we could know, and over the next April, May, 12 weeks, you know, 10 weeks, yeah. if we knew we had 13 people, you know, if we had a list in advance about what those were, it would help us to plan ahead so that even if we end up having to take up all 53 at the same meeting, we will have had time to make <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. It might not, I mean, that's month. going to be a two-hour meeting if there are two minutes discussion per, per person, whatever. Right. I mean, it's doable. Right, right. But 
I think what he said was that sometime after the budget process is concluded, that's when the mayor's office begins the process of reaching out to these people oh, I to see. see if they're interested in Okay, their so we're not going to see anything before So you would get a list, but you wouldn't know if all of those people are going interested right. in reappointment. Okay, but so. what we could at least do with that list, right, is we know that in 99% yeah, of you know, cases, people are um, recommended by the mayor's office for reappointment. Mm -hmm. And in probably 85% of those, people are going to still serve. Mm -hmm. So it would just give us, I mean, the sooner they could get, at least get us the list of those expiring, mm -hmm. we'd have just an easier, you know, because otherwise we're going to be left with having to make 53 calls or, right. you know, right. and it, you know a 50, even if it's 15 calls a piece, it's following up on all those in a matter of two, three weeks or something could be, could be challenging. You could definitely ask court for that list. To yeah. Know whether it would be until later. Right, knowing that we could at least know Not which maybe yeah, to give you a time frame too, like when he thinks they're going to begin contacting them. Or right, and we can identify people we already know on the list, and you know, be easy call, you know, those, those sorts of things. So the the only glitch in it, I think it's a great idea, is that the mayor mayor's office may have names on that list that maybe they want people to expire, and they have other candidates in mind. And well, that's why we can't call them yet until right. they, right. you know, but if it's clear to us that there's some of those that, you know, I mean, it's true that there may be people that are, in, that they know that they won't reappoint. Right. It, it would be helpful if they yes. know that now, they could right. kind of let us know to stay away from, you know. That would be a good email to send out now. Do you want to be reappointed? <laughs> but it's yes. also, it's also in the mayor's. That's prerogative right. to right. appoint or reappoint right. too. So right. there may be something in their office that and reappointments are easier than replace or whatever. Well, in theory, the communication should be between the mayor and the committee or board chair. Right. Um, it's not so much asking an individual member do you want to be reappointed. It's asking the chair of the committee. But they still need to ask the individual as well. True, but yeah, maybe the, the first call should be yeah. the board chair. Well, I mean, they could because every once in a while says. You know, this guy has been shown that up. I don't want to reappoint him. Right. There could be. Apparently, that's done with every reappointment. What I've been told is that the mayor's office does check, but maybe that's, you know, not been a consistent practice. At any rate, we're looking at what we're facing, which is the 53 by the end of June. Mm -hmm. We could add a layer by requiring another call to the. Oh, we could make those calls. We could make all those calls to the. Because I don't think we're going to get that level of. Assurance. From, uh, we might, you know, but it's yeah. going to be it's going to be a, and we're talking about we're talking about probably the May meeting and the June meeting, and I would think the July meeting because they won't have them they won't have gotten them all together. And usually our July meeting we end up having to you know it's right around four just the first Monday, so. I don't think you want to have to pass this up much. Yeah, I mean, it's possible we could meet, you know, five meetings in a row in June, you know, five days or whatever. I mean, it's we can always add more meetings right. if we That's need true. to. It's harder for me. I'm, I'm actually facing kind of some <laughs> challenges for a lot of driving back and forth. Right. So, at any rate, well, keep yeah. that in mind. And, yeah. and so, yeah. constantly. Well, yeah, and just for future. You know, oh, on that topic? Yeah, just one more thing. I, I think it would be helpful for us to really get this done before June 30th. I agree. Because then most it would then contacting people throughout the summer becomes more difficult. I so I think that if you know our our push is to meet and get our recommendations done, even if it, they wait till that next council meeting, you know, that first council meeting in July, that might even be okay. But just in terms of us tracking people down, well, what we I remember last year trying to call people while I'm on vacation, while they're on vacation. I agree with well, that. Well, what we That's know is that 53 people expire June 30th. So ideally, they would be reappointed before their expiration. Right. right. So it's possible that they're going to do all. They're going to have them expire and then have us after the fact to try to confirm a you know a reappointment. But you know we can all we can do is put it out there that. If the sooner that they get us any of those names, um, the sooner right. we can at least evaluate them and understand. 
Well, one thing we could do is at least, even though we know we can't make the calls until the mayor actually makes the reappointment, we can't actually make those calls to people. But if at least we have a sense, we can identify right. people we know, we can do that part of the work. So that would help. I mean, they might be reluctant to give it to us, knowing that they won't make their decision until uh, after budget. But we it can ask. be available on the web website somewhere for all I know. Like oh, yeah. If actually, I you know, I mean, if it, so, yeah. it's still, but they, if they were able to identify to you that there were 53 people, yeah, then they know their names. Know. So it would be helpful to us to have that information. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. And then Council of Arch had recommended um, oh, um, State the Connors State and the Veterans Council to come in um, for our next meeting which is really critical because we have not had them come in and talk about the Memorial Day Parade and the other functions coming up and so forth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good timing. Yeah. Not agreeable. That sounds great. If he's willing to come, that, that's a good next step for May. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't and like to come here, want to come. Oh, yeah, yeah. He will want to come. He likes yeah. it. And, and the, the, it usually brings a good entourage. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we can plan that for May, and then we don't know what will happen at the next, what, the April 4th, and then the April 18th meetings right. in terms of appointments. But we can figure that for our May meeting, we may likely get a bunch on the 4th and a bunch on. I haven't seen them in the preliminary. You didn't see anything in the preliminary. No, so you should give it to me like Tuesday at like 11.55. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tomorrow, then maybe home. Who knows? But that's what happens. Is we keep. Well, see in the next series of the next six meetings, they'll likely be a bunch. I think we can work something out. Yeah. I mean, just like with uh, Paul Spector and us. I mean, we had a, quite a bit of interviews, and we, our committee was strictly interviewing. Well, the, right. their their committee was only appointments. That was the name of their committee. All they did was appointments. Right. So the thing, the other thing they could do is, even though we know that there may be issues they're not sure about, they're not sure about 20% of them, it wouldn't take much to review that list and send us the, the names of the people they're sure that they would like to have reappointed. How would they know? Well, because they can look over and they can say, this person's been here and they know. You know what I mean? There's probably... There's probably a whole bunch of them that they know mm -hmm. that they want that they want. Right. right. And if they, they know that give they us want, a head start. yeah. yeah. Would be I right. mean, it, it just <laughs> ease up. It would just. I'm asking. It, it's not inappropriate for us for us to ask, given there'll be so many exactly. in a short period of time. And plus, the fact is, like some of them, even who are being reinstated, okay, reappointed. I mean, to go in again, they've already been accepted by the mayor, and then now they're going to be interviewed. Right. Right. So the sooner we know, the better anyway. And anything they can do to help is great. I know. I agree. Thank you, Laura. Anything else? Thank you. We're going to A motion. Oh, I would move to adjourn. <laughs> and we've been seconded to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you.